we um, made a video to mark the passing of Sir Clive Sinclair, but you worked with Sinclair. Can you take us through some of those, I won't say fantastic days, but perhaps it was just a, a day job. <laughs> tell, tell me about it. It was a slightly random thing, actually, the way it happened. Um, I, my PhD was in algebra, but I'd always had an interest in computers because my father worked at the National Physical Laboratory with computers there and showed them to me from, from an early age and got me programming in basic, things like that. So after I'd finished my maths PhD, I thought, well, I was still interested in computers, so I'd see the big wide world by applying to all the computer companies I could find in Cambridge and see if any of them had a job. So I wasn't working directly for Sinclair's, but through this company called Nine Tiles, owned and managed by um, a guy called John Grant. And he had already done the, uh, the ROM for the ZX80. And for the ZX81, which was the successor to that, they wanted a maths pack, floating point maths pack. And so they thought, well, they get a mathematician to do that. And they took me on. And I ended up not only doing the, the floating point maths, but also all the other things that the, the ZX81 had in addition to the ZX80. Um, when it, uh, when it was all completed, I wrote the manual, which they used, and um, to say what I'd put into it. And um, I had a, I mean, frankly, rather idiosyncratic touch to writing manuals, but it seemed to, to ring a bell with people. And um, so once the ZX81 was out of the way, we started work on the successor, which was the ZX80. So the spectrum. So the way it worked was my actual office was in was with nine tiles that started off in Ely and then moved to a village called Water Beach just outside Cambridge. But I'd go into Cambridge quite a lot um, to work with the Sinclair team, which was then in a about two or three floors in a very narrow building in Kings Parade, just opposite Kings College. And so that's where the actual Sinclair people were working. There was, um, uh, their main technical person was a guy called Jim Westwood. And uh, so he did, I think he did the, the, uh, the hardware for the, um, for the ZX81. And then my job was to write some code in Z80 assembler language blow it into ROMs, plug it into the hardware as it's being developed and see how it works. And there was also a designer there called Rick. He designed the cases. And um, so for the Spectrum, they got in um, a guy called Richard Altfassner. So he was doing the hardware and it worked the same way. I'd write software, blow it into the ROM, um, see how it works, direct it and, you know, gradually develop it. So the hardware and software were being developed in parallel. It's interesting you mentioned the manual as well, because I think a generation of uh, computer coders would like to say thank you to you. Um, <laughs> because I have to confess to not having had a, a Sinclair machine, but I know friends of mine, and that's how they started coding, because they looked in that manual and you explained very clearly how to, to go about starting from scratch and writing some code. It was a very, very good manual, actually. And in the manual was all these little example programs that went through basic. Basic was the language that it used. It was a, a basic machine using the basic language. But somewhere along the line, it became clear that uh, people were also wanting to use it to write machine code. So that wasn't something I'd had any experience of myself, but I thought, well, I'd better put in the information that would enable them to do that effectively. So they'd need various addresses and locations so that they can interact with the, with the operating system. And um, that seemed to have worked as well. They, they were able to write machine code that interacted effectively with the rest of the machine. So I was quite pleased with the way that turned out. What was the biggest challenge you had? Uh, you've got a, a mathematician's background and an interest in computing, but how do you, where do you start with that? I hadn't done any programming in my, um, ac you know, in, in my degree courses, but I had done some programming before I went to university uh, under my father's influence. And in fact, he'd got me a job for nine months between school and university at the National Physical Laboratory doing some programming. So I had some programming experience 
So I just, uh, you know, it just seemed to me a fairly natural thing to do. So it, was, uh, it took a, a little while to, to work out the idiosyncrasies of the Z80 um, CPU. And uh, I think the, the biggest challenge that covered the whole thing was basically the limitations of memory. So the ROM was only a fixed size. It was something like, uh, I don't know, I think it's about 4K for the, for the ZX81 and 8, maybe 16K for the Spectrum, which just sounds, you know, today you'd measure it all in, in megs and gigs. <laughs> um, but it all had to be fitted into the ROM. So that you had to use all the tricks in the book for reducing the number of bytes that you use. So we kind of weren't allowed to write, to call a subroutine and then return straight afterwards because that sort of wasted um, a push to the stack and, and then a pop. So you had to just jump to the subroutine and, and the return would take care of itself once you're there. Some of the numerical bits in the maths pack were a bit of a challenge. I remember going to a lot of work to uh, um, find out what was the most effective way of, of calculating logarithms. I think I was using Chebyshev polynomials, um, something like that. So the, there was one particular calculation where it took several days to work out what were going to be the most efficient ways of reducing the problem. But uh, that is interesting. I think, I think some of the things I was most pleased with were, were bits where, you know, like the beep, the sounds, right? So you say beep and you say uh, how long for and what pitch. And, um, and then it does it. So that was, uh, there's a kind of standard way of doing it where you give the pitch in terms of the frequency because basically it's just producing that number of clicks per second. But that's not at all the way you'd want to write down music. So uh, I wanted to make it more usable. So I had to um, work out how to express the pitch in terms of semitones. And that was, uh, so to convert from the pitch to the frequency, you actually have to use some, some logarithms. And so I had the logarithms in the maths pack and that was uh, that, would seem fine, except that they were very accurate, but quite slow. So I had to write some much quicker ones that were good enough for the purposes just to, to make it work. And so I was pleased with the way it came out because lots of other computers I'd seen, you know, you, you could control the, uh, um, control the, the, the pitch and, and the frequency, but it was all a bit difficult. Uh, whereas with the, the spectrum, you could, um, it was very easy to raise it up a semitone. You just add one to all the parameters. And uh, so I thought that was, I thought that's the way to do it, not the way it's been done previously. What else was a challenge? Deadlines. The deadline was always the next exhibition. So you have to get it, you have to get something demonstrable by the next exhibition. And that's just the way that, that Sinclair had product cycle worked. So um, sometimes the uh, what you saw at the exhibition wasn't quite what was intended to go to the public, but something that just... You needed to show up. something and yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah. Did you work with uh, Sir Clive at all? Not really, he's not a technical guy. He had a very good intuition for uh, costs. So he, one, the critical thing is, Every piece of hardware that goes into it has to be paid. There's a cost of it per unit. Wherever, whereas every, every bit of software that goes into it, there's one single overall cost when somebody, me or John Grant or whoever, writes it. And after that, it's just uh, divided by however many um, machines you make. So he knew that very well. He knew exactly that every transistor in the machine would cost more. Um, so he got other people to work out how to how to implement that to to get the cost down, but um, that was the main concern of his. So that there was there was very little interaction between me and him while uh, while I was I was doing my work. In fact, I remember 
at one point sitting him down in front of a spectrum and say, here it is, have a go. And he said, oh, I don't know how to use those things. <laughs> and I think that was true. You, did, you had no idea how you actually program a basic machine. Did you ever have any kind of input into how much of that uh, memory, you know, the K that you had to work with, or did they just say, here's 4K? That was a given. <laughs> in the manual, I wanted to put in a very simple example that, that users could just type in themselves. So I thought Frere Jacques. And then I thought, I mean, this is getting a bit fancy. And I thought, well, why not spice it up and instead use Mahler used the same theme, but in a minor key in his first symphony. So I thought, oh, we'll do that instead. And, and I had some fanciful remarks about what the Mahler music was doing. So that was basically Frere Jacques in the minor key that you could type in and program and get it to do it. And then as a little exercise at the end of the chapter, I jokingly said, uh, program up the whole of Mahler's first symphony, which was... Um, could only be a joke because the spectrum only had its one speaker, whereas the symphony obviously has a whole orchestra full of different instruments playing different notes. So nobody could ever do that. And then um, 30 years later, some guys got together and thought, well, actually we can do that if we get enough spectrums all working together. So they, they got all their spectrums and they got a Raspberry Pi to synchronize them. So that was the kind of uh, conductor. And they, uh, they put together a video. It wasn't the whole symphony, but it was the whole of that movement. <laughs> so I thought, what a waste. So if, if I'd known, 30 years ago that I could make a, a fanciful suggestion and 30 years later people and computers would get together and, and make a reality of it. I'd, I'd have thought of something more useful, more world-changing, but never mind. <laughs> so after the spectrum, Richard Outbasso, um, he and uh, I uh, were thinking, uh, well, why are we making all this money for Clive Sinclair? Why can't we just make it for ourselves? So it's easy to forget now that, that it was this was delivering a computer for a hundred pounds 